My name is John Myatt. I'm the CTO of the networking and infrastructure team at Imagine. And uh, in one of my other roles, I'm also the document editor for SMPTE 2110, which is the new standard you've heard a great deal about this week. I'm also a director of the Video Services Forum and a director of the Advanced Media Workflow Association. And so I wanted to talk today about how to use these new technologies to make television, because in the end, that's the business we're all in, is helping you make television. Now, first, a little bit about why. You know, why do you move to IP? Because IP fundamentally is about operating at scale. So if you wanted to build a big facility in UHD, you're probably not going to do that with SDI just because of the scale of the system. But equally, moving the signals onto IP helps you move the workflow elements into software. Every computer you buy has an IP interface built in. And so increasingly, every, every server class computer you buy has 10 gig or 25 gig Ethernet as the standard network protocol that's built onto the motherboard. So moving the signals into IP helps you natively use those interfaces to do practical work. All that said, today is the golden age of SDI routing. SDI routers have never been better than they are right now. They're fully featured, the features are all debugged, they ship, they install, they work except for that matter of UHD and scalability and so forth. So SDI is probably not the future of our industry, but it is the present and it is a valuable tool to use in building small projects and projects where SDI is appropriate. So the trick really is to figure out what is your actual need and then work with vendors like us where we can enable you to transition to IP while using what's good about SDI today and we integrate that all in a proper control system. So the ideal solution really helps you get there gradually at a pace that makes sense. So if, like Tiago did, you have a new building and it's all greenfield, build IP, it's great. But if, like some other customers, you have an existing facility and you have to add on very incrementally, we can do that too. It's the, the trick is for us using true commercial off-the-shelf hardware computers from people who make computers, Ethernet switches from people who make Ethernet switches. I know it sounds like a radical idea, but there's people who think otherwise. Ultimately, scalability is about being able to grow at the time you need. Now, the whole point of moving to IP rests on the idea of using standards, using real standards that are used the same way by everybody. So we've been deeply involved, both personally and as a company, in making these standards work. So the set of SMPTE standards, like SMPTE 2022-6 for doing SDI over IP, the 2059 standard, which my colleague Lee Whitcomb is one of the editors of that document, the SMPTE 2110 standard, where I've been acting as the editor of that for the last year and a half, and of course the AMWA ISO 4 and 05 standards for identifying and controlling equipment in the network. These standards are what enable you to buy equipment from us and from other vendors and put it together with the full expectation that it's going to work and work properly. And it's a vital part of having a successful transition. So SMPTE 2110, the whole idea is that SMPTE 2110, all the parts of the signal, the video, the different audio channels, the ancillary data parts, are routable separately in IP. So they're all in one network cable but they're all separate signals. This is what Ethernet switches do best, and we let them do it. So the standard's divided into a couple of parts. There's an overview document that talks about how timing works between all the parts. There's a video document that describes how video works. There's an audio document that describes how audio works. Now, the audio document's very short, because what it says is, use AES-67. You'd think it wouldn't take five pages to say that, but it, it does in a SMPTE document. So the audio is 100% compatible with AES-67. And as you walk the halls, you'll notice that that's what the audio industry is using. So we wanted to be completely compatible with how the audio industry is evolving their own workflow. Um, for signals that are not normal audio, but are maybe Dolby E or something else, there's a Dash 31 document that describes that special case. And then the Dash 40 document, which is going to be published any day now, describes how ancillary data works. So all the things we've buried into SDI ancillary data over the years, we have a strategy for managing those in the IP network. So a little bit about design considerations, and I'll let Tiago talk about the reality. Um, when you're designing a system, you have to really think through 
how big is this going to get? What scale? You know, am I going to plan for UHD or not? Am I going to plan for everything being 3 gig or not? And how you answer those questions radically affects how you design your system. The second question you have to ask is, which of the devices in the network natively speak IP? Because I have to get gateways for the rest of them. If they speak SDI, I have to turn them into IP. And so you just have to know the answers to those questions to design the system. There's no right answer, it's just you have to know. Now, redundancy, in television we care about redundancy. And so if you think about these IP networks, you have all these devices, they're connected to a switch. Well, gee, that switch really just looks like a big failure mode waiting to happen. So our strategy in that is to use two. So you have a main switch, and another main switch, and they truly are dual hot. Both signals are present all the time, and it's a hitless merge, so it's not as though something fails and then you recover. It really is a hitless merge of signals. So you can take failures in either network as long as the packet gets there somehow. And this is very powerful. We've had customers that have had one of their switches fail, and they didn't notice because nothing changed. It all worked, everything kept working, and then maybe after the show was done, someone noticed, oh, hey, you know, that switch failed. Um, it's a really powerful mechanism. All that said, people talk about spines and spines and leafs and single switches and how do I design all this. Our usual process is to use something I like to call engineered non-blocking dual spine leafs. So you have your A spine and your B spine, and they are redundant like we just showed and then they connect out to separate leaf switches for the cases that you need to aggregate. But for cases like gateways where you can really put a bunch of signals into one cable, if the, signal, if the wire is full, run it straight to the spine. There's no point in taking a 100 gigabit ethernet that's full of signals and running it through a leaf just to take it to the spine. It just adds cost. So signals that are full 100 gig signals that are full, take them straight to the spine. But if you have, say, a software application and a blade server, and you've got a lot of those running, let the blade server aggregate those up and then take a pretty full 100 gig to the spine. Or if you have some you know, 10 gigabit devices, aggregate those up in a, uh, you know, in a leaf switch with 10 gig ports, and then take a couple of 100 gigs up to the spine. The switch vendors have largely moved to 100 gigabit as their standard interface, and so that's the most cost-effective thing they sell. Now, some people ask, you know, oh, can this IP stuff scale? Well, if you think about some of these switches, like the 7280CR48, it has 4,800 gig ports. Well, that's the equivalent of a 1,500 by 1,500 3 gig SDI router. So that's pretty good. You know, it's a 2RU switch, and a 1500 squared SDI router is quite large. Um, then if you need something actually large, you can get into the RISTA 7508s or the Cisco Nexus 9508s, where you've got in the order of 250 100 gig ports. And that's like a 4,000 or 8,000 squared SDI router. That's just, I've never seen one that size. Um, so these IP switches, can scale to larger than anyone has ever built an SDI infrastructure. So fundamentally, there's three ways to approach making an IP-based plant. So one is you say, well, I have an SDI router, I have a big core, everything's SDI, but I have a little bit of IP stuff coming. So you take your SDI router, you drop a few cards in it as gateways, and you attach the IP things, but it's mostly SDI. And that's fine, and we support that you can go straight to the end game and you can say, okay, I'm gonna go whole hog, IP switches, and I'm gonna gateway the SDI stuff. And that's fine and we support that. And you can also do the model in the middle where you have an SDI core and an IP core and tie lines between them. And we support that model too. It really depends on the details of those first couple of questions about what percentage of your devices natively support IP, which require gateways, and how big it's all gonna get. You work out the math of those, and one of these answers will be cost effective. We're not in the business of pushing on you that you have to do something a certain way. We have a toolkit you can use to make the project you need. So enough about talking about theoretical. My friend Tiago, he built a real project, and it's more interesting to hear about a real project. Well, so very nice to meet you. I'm Tiago Brill. 
I work in television for 12 years. I work as project manager at TV Global. So uh, for those who are not familiar with TV Global, we are a company that is a leader in communications in Brazil. We have around five broadcast facilities in strategic regions and a set of more than 100 affiliates that help us to cover almost 100% of the whole national territory and the linear TV. Uh, we also have uh, our content being watched in 109 countries. And we have our international TV, which is much more for Brazilian people around the world. We have a strong presence uh, on the internet and with our digital platform, the uh, over-the-top platform that we call Global Play. That's our case study that I'm going to present to you today. So basically, I'm going to cover pretty much of this agenda. So the challenge that we had in this project, why we moved to the, to the IP, what were the challenges of the implementation that we faced, and what we do expect in the future. Well, let's start uh, talking a little bit about, about, about the challenge that we had. So first of all, uh, one of the things that we would like to do was to consolidate all the operations that we had around Pernambuco, which is the uh, northeast region in Brazil, and the single broadcast facility. So we had uh, basically uh, a broadcast facility, another uh, headquarter where we have all the marketing, commercial. So we're going to bring all together. And the biggest challenge besides the IP, which is going to be covered in this presentation, was to migrate all the operation without any disruption of the signal on the air. So we had to migrate everything uh, while we are doing the transmission. So we step by step, we migrate the RSGX center. We establish a, a connections through fiber, through radio between the sites. And then we migrate uh, the mask control and then uh, the news, finally. So, and also we, uh, we had this decision that we have to make. So this is where we were in 2014 when we got the budget approved. So this was more a project tool for migration, but we also had to, the challenge to treat the obsolescence of the uh, infrastructure. So in 2014, uh, the, uh, the IP was not really mature yet. Uh, we had, you know, a lot of uh, standards coming up in 2015. So basically, SMT 22-6, uh, the TRL4, TRL3, the PDP. But it was uh, pretty clear for us that we uh, didn't want to invest in a STI infrastructure in an old-fashioned way if we are doing this investment uh, thinking about the long term. We are not going to build a new broadcast facility. It's not making any sense for us at that time. Because, you know, we have more and more, we have uh, the pressure for new formats uh, to run uh, efficiently uh, our infrastructure. So that's what we were aiming in 2017, basically uh, to have this optimized infrastructure and guarantee a little bit of future-proof deployment. This is where we were in 2014. <laughs> was clear path on the baseband. And from the project management perspective, it's amazing, I mean, to have a pretty well-defined scope where, you know, you have a very strength plan and you know exactly what the way you're going to go through. And we're looking at the IP. Okay, we know where is the holy grail. It's sitting out there, but, you know, you have to pave all the world. And that was a good, a good thing that we uh, had to do. And I think it was the best decision that we had to, uh, for, for, for the business, for, for the company. So we believe that the baseband was not future-proof. But either way, in the IP, we were not you know, willing to go into the uh, old-fashioned way that we uh, had to create an infrastructure for the master control and a separate infrastructure for journalism. So we are defining the assumption that we, we would have one, just one system to support both production and programming. And also, uh, which is very challenging. I mean, uh, 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 we were breaking a, uh, a paradigm for 
that we used for many years. So the stand was in progress of the animation, the TL4 was not ready, uh, was in certain future, the vice was not ready, so... But either way, we decided to, to move in that direction. And then uh, we went through uh, an entire process with some uh, solution providers in, uh, uh, that were bringing on this uh, infrastructure. And we test a lot. We do a lot of benchmarking. It turns out that we've, we choose Imagine. Uh, and the solution that I'm going, to, I'm going to present that we feel a lot confident to, to work with. So just talking a little bit about this, the, the, the challenge that we had. So this is a macro view of the, uh, the whole implementation. So basically, uh, in the production environment, we use TL4 at the time, so 2022-6 with the S6 or 7 essence. Of course, we have separate essences to, to work in the production environment. So all the signals that were coming in and out uh, from the production to the master control in the RXCX center was in 2022-6. And then it goes to a transmission. A little bit more in detail. Uh, this is when we was really started. I mean, the, one of the first architectures that we uh, we started to discuss in 2015. So how are we going to do that? The, the first proposal we got was a centralized core, where we had all the gateways connected to it, and all you know the legacy STI uh, equipment connected to the gateways. But we didn't believe that was the best design, because looking at the mid long term, if we had to evolve with that architecture, would, be, would not be you know, really cost effective. So that's why we migrated to this architecture, the spine leaf, as John mentioned before, where you have the core switches with a huge amount of bandwidth, so one, 100 gig ports. And also we have the leaf switches with uh, 10 gig connections and uplinks and 100 to the uh, spine switches. And of course, that as soon as the uh, IP becomes a mass adoption, and I think that's going to it's going to start right now with the publication of 2110. Uh, more and more, we're going to have devices that connect directly with uh, the leaf switches, so you're not need anymore the gateways. And at the time, we also treat the obsolescence of the audio mixing console that we uh, it's connected directly through the IP. All the uh, equipment from both production and master control are connected directly to this. Uh, spine leaf architecture, so you do not have that kind of a you know physical um, workflow as you used to have in the past with STI. Of course, you, you you see the things that were connected, and you see exactly what is the workflow. So everything is logical, and we are leveraging this architecture to have a better efficiency in terms of infrastructure provisioning for both areas. Giving a little bit more about the details and what John mentioned before. We have, um, this is the spine leaf architecture that we deployed. So we, uh, in the beginning, uh, we started, uh, we actually, we closed a partnership with Imagine and Cisco and, and we started using the DCNM uh, to, to control dynamically the routing. But it turns out we, we, we found some issues in, in the beginning and we decided to have the DCNM monitoring uh, the, the infrastructure. So basically right now we, ha we, we deploy it with, with Cisco and it's a very good partnership, uh, the, the non-blocking multicast algorithm where you have bandwidth allocation uh, for all of the traffic that you have for video and for all your essences. So basically you, you want to make sure during the design of the network that you have enough bandwidth to, you know, uh, go through all the signals that you you intend to have in your network. And you want to make sure that, as, as, as John mentioned before, uh, if it, something breaks, you, you, you have a redundant routing, so 2022-7. Uh, so this architecture needs to have high availability. This is the core business of our companies. And it turns out that's working really fine. So there is also a thing that's uh, important to to mention about this, also the culture change. We had some key findings, and we separated in, in four different layers here. 
So from the deploying perspective, we have to, to deal with four different solution providers. So one for reference, one for the LU, one for the SDN and gateways, and then another one for networking. And it was really interesting uh, way that we uh, conduct a system integrators inside of the company to bring every, everyone together whenever we had an issue that we have to figure out what was, you know, the root cause and so on. I think we, we converge really fast in that, in that perspective. And uh, I think that it made us a lot of comfortable and more confident with everything that we were doing because it was not uh, the first initiative that we had, but in that perspective, with that dimension, to have a, an entire broadcast facility with the, uh, the core and IP was the first time for us. The second thing was about the security that was very concerned about. So one of the things that we decided to do was to keep separate networks. So one for the live IP, the other one for file-based workflows and legacy IT, traditional uh, IT, uh, in separate networks. Just want to make sure that you know we are comfortable enough to move forward with the IP and all the uh, external connections. You know, a lot of breaches uh, and many cases uh, that happen with some of our friends in the broadcast industry. So we're, we're, move, we're doing this step by step. So from the maintenance perspective, it's also an important thing because the way that you operate, you know, this kind of uh, infrastructure is completely different where we used to do in the past. Uh, there's no physical patches anymore. There's no that technical area where the, the engineering crew used to sit and take the decisions there. So we now have a network operation center where we can monitor the network, we can monitor the bandwidth of each uh, path, and then take the decisions from that. So this is another thing that we had to train a lot. So we had to review workflows, and one thing that was very key for us is was to create a program that we went through all the you know, problems. OK, if this fails, how we're going to react? And if that fails, how we're going to react? So we trained a lot our, our teams in order to get all this knowledge and give confidence to them to operate. Because we don't have right, you know, the, uh, the, all the knowledge from the traditional engineering and the, the, the IT people, although IP was not something new for us, of course, that we are dealing with the IP for more than a decade. But that knowledge was not concentrated in just a single team. So we had to uh, test and uh, train a lot in that perspective. So the next move that we did was a uh, remote operation. This is uh, the most important carnival parade in the Sifi area. Uh, I don't know how to translate that. It's the Galo da Madrugada. Uh, so this is the Capibaribe River. So we, ha we have around, I would say, about 2.5 million people here. So we did the remote operation in our broadcast facility, bringing in and out all the signals. Uh, it was really interesting experience and much easier to set up what you used to do in the past, you know, with all uh, distributors, you have to mount the racks and, and <laughs> add more signals. It was everything in the routing, so very easy to configure all the monitoring. So it was really nice experience and much more comfortable for the operation. This is my brilliant team that helped me a lot, I mean, with this deployment, besides all the great partnership that we have with Imagine and all those players that helped us a lot with this project. So that's it. Thank you very much. Obrigado. <laughs> any questions? See if there's questions. Well, any questions, uh, more than glad. How long did it take you to uh, create the new facility and make the transition? When we defined the technology, it took about, uh, for the whole facility, one year and a half, I mean, of deployments and migration. We had to plan a lot uh, how we were going to do all the pieces that we were going to bring from one side to the other. So it took that time. Okay. How, how long did you operate in parallel with old and new? Uh, it was about seven months during this parallel operation. I mean, because we, we had to move these 
Yes, one RSCI by one. RSCI sender yes. one by one. So we really want to make sure that everything was really going fine. We actually uh, did a lot of things besides the IP. We, we, uh, we also uh, put an automation system and a master control <laughs> in parallel, you know how it is, right? So it was a, a really uh, interesting and exciting project, I would say. As a follow-up question, were any of your uh, steps in your construction or your development, were they delayed in any way with the development of these standards as they were being defined? Yeah, uh, at the time, Imagine had already some deployments with other customers uh, and helped us a lot, you know, to figure out the best ways to, to do the implementation. But of course, that uh, the, the, the thing that I mentioned about the um, uh, that particular thing on the architecture that now evolved a lot with the DCNM, uh, it slowed down just, just a little, but uh, I think that we're pretty much aligned with the plan that we did. And we're very, we're very glad that was a, a very successful project for us. One of the main concerns of the operation was to really, you know, be confident with all this change uh, you used to do for many years in one way, so you have to do it another way. So that preparation uh, takes a little bit more time, but was very intensive in the sense that, you know, we want to make sure that everyone is confident to to go for it. Other questions? Um, what about the camera feeds? Are yep. those IP also? And what about uh, the PCR environment? Yep. The video mixers and the audio mixers, is everything IP? Mm, well, not yet. So we, uh, we had the opportunity to, to design I mean, to change just the core of the, uh, the infrastructure. So basically, the, we, we exchange. I, I, I like the, the first slide that John put in here. We changed the ex existing, you know, STI router, all the chassis that we used to have with distribution, that kind of layer, into the IP network. Uh, we, we, we are not treating the upset distance of the rest of the equipment. So basically, they're all in STI going to the gateways, and then we have the audio mixing console. This one is IP. So uh, we change that one and connect it direct to the, to the leaf switches. Okay, but maybe in future when you buy some new cameras, they Absolutely. can cameras. Absolutely. Yes. So that's, that's our belief. I mean, with 2110, I believe that the whole industry converged to a point where uh, there is a, a common ground, right, John? That's, that's our hope. That's, I think that uh, that's our hope too. I think that more and more we're going to see the endpoint equipments and uh, the IP domain. So it's going to be pretty easier to connect to the network. All right. So thank you all for coming today. And thank you very much.